ask my uh, mom to come up here, if she could, for a second. Alice Bauer. My mom uh, recently had a dream, and it was just very similar to something I was going to share today, so I wanted you guys to hear about the dream, and then I'll take it from there. Go right ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, I had this dream, and it took place in my hometown where I grew up, and it took and I was living in my, um, the home that I grew up in. And I grew up in a very small community, so everybody knew everybody else. Um, and in the dream, my, our neighbors across the street, their daughter was getting married. And um, all the neighbors were coming and the friends and family to prepare for this wedding that they were going to have. So... Um, my part in the wedding, I received three terracotta pots to decorate. And it was, I must dream in color, because it was pink um, uh, gingham material with a pink bow that I was supposed to decorate these terracotta pots with. And they were about that big, and they had a flower in them. And, and I also was occupied about what was I going to wear to the wedding. And I procrastinated. And I got to get those terracotta pots decorated, and I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off to a point where somebody came and took the terracotta pots and replaced it with a very small one. And the time was coming, and I still didn't have what I was supposed to wear to the wedding, and everything was like not getting done. I just wasn't preparing myself to get this done. And so I took that small pot and the material I had and I just wrapped it and it looked awful. It wasn't even good enough for the wedding. And apparently I didn't even go to the wedding because I woke up at that point and I knew exactly what God was telling me. I didn't need anybody to interpret that dream, but I was putting off the things. I was putting off ministry. I was putting off learning his word. And he was like saying to me, there's more there and that you can go to that wedding and be prepared to go. Amen. Thank you. If I could. Um, I remember the first time that I that I, I when salvation came into view, and when I say salvation, I, I, I mean, in the expression of one day, like going, stepping into eternity to be with God. I, I remember being like a young boy and learning that concept because I just couldn't help to ask the question, like, what's after this life? Like, what are we going to be doing? Like, what's it look like? And salvation, although it seems basic, it's probably the most important thing that you could ever, ever talk about, be aware of, and what that looks like. Did you know that the Apostle Paul, let, let me just read to you something he wrote. I, I just think this is fascinating. In 1 Corinthians 9, 23 through 26, it says this, And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win, and everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. So this is what he's saying. He's saying, when these guys train for the race, everything they do has the race in mind. Does that make sense? And Paul's comparing this, that imperishable wreath is that, is that salvation that he's talking about. It's, it's eternity. So everything that Paul does, he has eternity in mind. And he doesn't want to be disqualified from the race, from eternity. Now, you've got to catch your theology up. What, what's, what's Paul saying then? It's actually Paul, possible for him to be disqualified from the race. This is the Apostle Paul saying, I don't want to be disqualified. Does that make sense? How many, like, so, so here it is. How many of you guys know when you're running? Like, you can actually, like, feel the concrete and you're, you're running. You know, if you're running, you know you're running. So you know when you're in a race that you're running in a race. And when you're running, it's very easy to say, I'm in the race, but it's when you stop running that you're no longer in the race. 
and you don't want to stop running this race. You don't want to, like, salvation isn't something small. It's not something little. It's not something that's like, well, I can't wait to get there one day, and, and like, well, one day we'll deal with that. It, today is probably the most important day of your life. That'll be the most sober day of your life. And when I read scripture, it's, it's, I don't need God to do something for me it, like else. He's, he's, he is, he loves me. He's, he's gone to the extreme to show that to all of you. He's laid down his life. He's spilled his blood. It's not a question of his character. It's a question of our character and what we're going to do with the blood of Jesus in this lifetime. Are you guys following me? So it's not like, well, what's, like, what's heaven and hell and all? What's his character? He's displayed his character. What are you going to do about it? He's already said, I love you, and not has just said it, but he has shown it. He's laid down his life. There's nothing more he could possibly do for you to express his love for you. And then now the question is, do we love him, and what are we going to do with this love that he's expressed? Are you guys following me? And here's something that just scares me like, to the bone, it's so sobering. Like, when you read these parables about Jesus, and, and he's talking to you guys about eternal things, the people who show up in hell didn't think they were going there. They were surprised by it. Because they thought they were in the race, but they, at some point they had stopped, and they weren't in the race anymore. And they, 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 they allowed sin to kind of take over in their life. They they, they didn't have any deeds. There were people who were sick that they didn't go visit. There, was, there were things that they didn't do, and there were things that they were doing that disqualified them from the race. You might say, well, I thought it was all about grace. I thought we were saved by grace. You are invited to the wedding. You are invited. I don't know if you're going to show up. That's up to you. Does that make sense? So, but, so you prepare to show up for a wedding. And what I, love about the, what I love about my mom's dream when she was explaining to me, I said, you know, that is, that is just such an incredible dream. It's like, I, I, I've done that myself. I've, I've not been sober. I've not prepared. I've, I've let the enemy throw seeds into my life and let those things grow up. And, and I, I've let things wreak havoc that weren't supposed to be there. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for his leading. And thanks God for cleaning that out. And it's a big deal that you're sitting here today. There's nothing small about attending church. It's a big deal. It means, it means that at least in your sight, you're still running towards eternity. It's important enough to be here. Amen? If you guys want to clap that you're here, you go right ahead. Yeah. But it's such a, it's such a, it, it is, it is a slow fade. You know what I determined as a little boy? I'm not going to hell. I said, whatever I do in this life, I'm not going there. Absolutely, 100%, I am not going there. And then like when the Lord called me into ministry, I was like, whew, at least now I have to be involved in this thing, you, you know? I said, it'll probably go well for me if I'm a pastor. And it's not going to go well. It's double judgment, right? Yeah. Yeah. But this, this, this thing, like, and God kind of just revealed to me his heart towards me this week about eternity and his desire for you to be with him. He can desire all he wants for you to be with him, but it's not up to him whether or not you're with him. It's up to you of whether or not you want to be with him. Does this make sense? And so to go back to what Paul was saying, Paul is saying this, listen, I know that I'm saved, but I also know that I can be disqualified. So I'm, and everything that I'm involved in, I keep this salvation in view so that I might not be disqualified. When I run into people like that who have that theology, they are sober. And they don't have stuff in their life that they're messing around with. It's when people have this. I know that I'm saved. I always will be saved. And there's nothing that could ever take that away from me. When I hear people say that, it scares me to death. And they got all kinds of weird stuff going on in their life. And they're dabbling around with sin and they think it's okay because God's just going to forgive them. And the Bible talks about loving darkness more than, than, than Christ. And man, like you just don't want to get entangled up in that stuff or mess around with it. It leads to death, right? And some people say, well, like, why, does, why is there hell and why, why do people have to go there? Sin leads to death. That's where it leads. Just like going 60 miles per hour into a telephone pole leads to death, right? So don't go 60 miles per hour into a telephone pole, right? You're in the car. You're steering your life. So don't do that. 
I want to talk to you guys just a little bit about the, uh, the parable of the ten virgins. And before I do that, I just want to make some comparisons to what I believe Jesus is talking about. He gets very sober on the back end of his ministry. So let me just say this. Jesus gets very sober in what he's saying around Matthew 25 at the end of his ministry to, towards his disciples. And he starts to focus on, hey, make sure you finish the race. Okay? At the front end of it, it's very like, hey, there's a lost coin. There's a lost sheep. There's the prodigal of the son. And I love you. And like, I'll do anything for you. And, and it's like, you guys want to be fishers of men? Sure. Right? And then towards the back end of the ministry, he gets very sober in what he's saying to them and very serious. And thank God we get to hear these words. Let me just talk to you guys a little bit about marriage so you guys can understand the role of the ten virgins in it. When a, a husband would come, right, to the wife, he would come, and oftentimes before he would come to the wife with the marriage contract, somebody would announce his coming. So it was almost like a messenger that would go ahead. And in John 1, 22 and 23, it says this. They said to him, who are you? So that maybe we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And this is, they're talking to John, right? And these people are from the Pharisees, and they're going to go back and tell the Pharisees what he says. He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Okay, so oftentimes when a king would come to town, they would actually like build roads. There was a famous road in the, in the Old Testament, and, and it's still around today. It was called the King's Road. It was built. The king would actually build roads so he could get places easier, okay? And bridges would get built so that the king wouldn't have to like uh, take the long way around. So like roads were actually built for kings, okay? And, and Christ is this, this, this groom who's also a king. And oftentimes when the groom would come into town, someone would announce that he's coming. And this is what John the Baptist says about himself. And he also says it in John 3, 28 through 30. It says, you yourselves bear witness, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. So what John the Baptist is saying is like, I'm the friend of the bridegroom who got to show up and actually see the proposal being made by the groom, to the bride, okay? And then this is what ends up happening. This guy, he would, he would show up, and he would have a, a marriage contract, and in the marriage contract, there would be a bride price. The bride price was often given to the father of the bride to say, is this enough, or is this honoring you enough for the way that you've raised your daughter? Does it include all the expenses that you've put into your daughter and the price also includes how much the future husband loves the wife. Are you guys following me? So how much were you bought for? What were you bought at? What price? The blood of Christ. That was the price of the worth that the father saw on you and the son that you're actually worth the blood of Jesus. It is a bride price. It is, it is the most valuable, the most expensive thing anybody has ever, ever done for you is lay down their life for you in blood. Amen? So that's the proposal. After the proposal um, was given, they'd pour a cup of wine. The uh, future husband would pour a cup of wine and give it to the bride. And the bride, if they accepted it, would, would drink this. Okay? And then when the groom left, he would say, um, remember me. Okay? Because I'm leaving for a time to go and build our room on my father's house. Okay? Is this sounding familiar? So Jesus said, like, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Where are you going? I'm going to build my father's house. There's a place for you. If not so, I would not have said that to you. So he's going away. He's actually going to build something. And come on, if Jesus is building it, it's not going to be shoddy, right? Like he's, he's actually, I love the vision that you had of him with nails in his, in his mouth. And he's, he's building onto his father's house a place for you. That's one of the gifts that you're going to get on that day, is you're going to get this place. Isn't that cool? This young man, they would share it. They'd share that drink. And um, 
In Matthew 26, 27 through 29, it says, And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's saying, at the marriage supper, when we get there, at that wedding day banquet, is when we're going to share this cup again, when they get married, okay? So... When that man would leave, now he would literally be leaving the house to go and build on his father's house, he would shower the bride, the future bride, in gifts, okay? How many of you guys know that you've been given gifts? I love it. In Ephesians 4, 8 through 11 through 12, it says this, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And oftentimes the gift that the husband would leave the bride was actually in preparation for that day. Do you guys know what we're going to be wearing or what it is that we're preparing ourselves with on that day? The white linen in Revelations 19 talks about the righteous acts of the saints. So the gifts he gave us is for preparation for our righteous acts to be wearing on that day for him. Isn't that cool? Before leaving, the young man would announce, I am going to prepare a place for you. And the young man would return to his father's house and build a honeymoon suite there. In John 14, 2 through 3, it says this, In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And when he said, when he was asked, well, when would you return? He would say this, only my father knows. Why does only the father know? Because the father is the one who inspects the room to make sure that it brings that bride great honor. So he doesn't know when he's going to come back. Whenever the father thinks the house is worthy enough, does he then release him to come back? And what does Jesus say about his return? Only the Father knows. That's just basically how it's going to go. Just repeat what I said. (laughs) I don't know what he said. Matthew 24, 36 through 7. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone, for the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. So then the bride would make herself ready, and she would groom herself and make her pure for that day, because from that point forward, all she has is her eye on the wedding and being prepared for that day, because it's a big deal, because you could bring great shame onto your future groom and onto the father of the groom if you're not ready and prepared. So she would be prepared. I mean, could you guys imagine, like, putting on your wedding dress and then just, you know, for nine days and just being ready to go and be married? One of the things that she would do is she would wear a veil when she went out to show show that she was spoken for because she had been bought with a price. So the world could no longer see her. And she could no longer see the world in the same way because her eyes were veiled too. The world and that bride had nothing in common anymore because she didn't want anything that was in the world. She wanted her husband. And she looked forward to the day when he came and lived every day in preparation for that day to get here to make sure that she was ready. So this is what the custom was. She would keep a lamp nearby her veil on, and everything she needed by the side of her bed that she was going to take with her was already packed and ready to go. She was waiting for someone to come into town and blow the shofar. When the shofar was blown, it could have been at any, any moment, that meant her husband was almost there, grab your things and your bridal party and walk outside and come and meet your husband. Now that brings us up to what, so what's the parable of the ten virgins about? The parable of the ten virgins is actually about her being in her house with her ten close friends, right, her bridal party, and them being prepared for when the groom enters into town, when they hear the shofar. 
You guys following me? All right. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. See, the, the, the whole thing about this parable is that they're not prepared. They took their lamps. They didn't take their lamps and oil. You need, a lamp doesn't do you any good. You actually need oil in it. Just like faith alone doesn't, is dead. It doesn't do you any good. It actually requires acts, right? And five of them were foolish and five were prudent. And every time you see that word foolish in the Bible, in the New Testament, in a parable, it often refers to this. The bigger picture was ignored and someone got lost in the day-to-day. And they were not prepared for the day. They got lost and they got tunnel vision on what was going on in their life that was in front of them. You think about the guy who built the big vats and you know, poured all of his riches into the vats, and then that day his life was going to be taken from him. And he spent his whole day preparing for a life he wasn't going to have. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent, those who had wisdom, took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, I've, 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 I've sat here and I've thought about this and I said, like, how, how could you take a lamp and no oil? Like, what is that? Now, oil requires money. And so pretty soon in the parable, we're going to see these ladies walk off and go purchase the oil. But if you think about this, have you guys ever done anything dumb? Are you guys brilliant all the time? I've done some dumb things. Like I've been in a place and I've like wondered where my keys are and my car is on with the keys in them. You know what I mean? Like I I was in such a hurry, I did not have time to turn off the car. Um, I've done some, I've done really dumb things. But We don't, we, didn't, we don't live in a world like they lived in, so we don't understand it. Like, it's like, what, what's the serious day we could think of? Like, well, like a wedding day. Like, let's say you're the, the best man. It's like showing up 20 minutes late to a wedding. It's, that's, like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, that's, it's not, it's, not, it's beyond dumb, it's rude. You, you guys following me? Or, or somebody has a, a very, very special day, and you were so busy with what you wanted to do, that you lost sight of how serious the day was, and then you did whatever. Like, could you imagine if someone showed up a half hour late for the wedding, and they were actually in the wedding, and they were asked, well, what were you doing? And it's like, well, I was taking a bath. It's like, what, what do you mean you were taking a bath? Like, you, all of these people, like, you cost hundreds of hours of people's time just so you could take, like, a bath. Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's... It's ruder than that. It's it's a it's this is done in public, and I, I wish I could I wish I could just you know un- help you understand what an honor and shame culture is. If you bring shame onto somebody, it's 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 more than physical. It's 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 social. It's known. It's it's like you come down a few pegs whenever somebody does this to you. When these women show up and they're not ready to go because there's not ten of them, there's only five of them. That brings shame on the groom. That brings shame on the bride because you were not intelligent enough or smart enough or even cared enough to make sure you were ready in this ceremony that's done in public that everyone's going to see like, well, where's the other five people for this wedding party? And why the disrespect? And oh man, like maybe this wedding's cursed. Like they start to talk that way back in this day. And these five just didn't bring money, and it costs, it costs money to bring oil, and I, I'm, the Christian life will cost you everything. It costs you everything to participate with Christ. It's not like, it's not like well, I'm going to incorporate Christ into my life, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to decide what he's cool with and what he's not cool with. He tells you very clearly what he's okay with and what he's not okay with. And I'm not trying to incorporate Christ into my life so I can do the things that I want to do in my flesh and and still try to work it over so that I can go to heaven. It's everything or it's nothing. You guys following me? 
And see, I knew this as a kid. I knew that some of the things I was hearing, because like I'd open up the Bible, and I had a good news Bible with little illustrations of stick figures, and I'd open it up, and I'd be like, oh, oh my goodness. And I'd watch all of the goats who walked by people who were in need walk into hell. It was sobering. And I never heard a pastor talk on it. I never heard a pastor kind of get to the nitty-gritty of what it is that Jesus was saying, and he talked about judgment a lot. Why? Because he cares about you, and he doesn't want to see anything bad happen to you. And if there was a cliff, and I knew that my kid was going to go camping close to that cliff, I'd have several conversations with my kid about the cliff. I'd be like, okay, listen, here's a cliff. Come with me over to the cliff. Here's a stone. Watch. Okay, pretend that was your body. You'd be broken into a million pieces. Watch out for this cliff. Don't get near the cliff. It's possible for you to fall off the cliff, so don't get near the cliff. Here, let me tell you a story about what somebody fell off the cliff. This is how he ended up falling off the cliff. So I don't want you to fall off the cliff. Because he cares for his kids. That's why he talks about hell, because he doesn't want anybody to go in there. Because it's his desire that all be saved. But it's not up to him, it's up to you. You guys get it? You might see, but Adam, I'm sitting here, I'm saved, like everything's fine, everything's doing well. Stay sober, stay vigilant. How is your prayer life? You're reaping your prayer life. And if you're not, if you're not sober and serious around that thing, if you're not seeking the face of the God, when you're by yourself, what are you doing? There's things that are going to creep, creep into your life. There's probably schemes already mapped out in your life from the enemy. You might even be in some right now. Are you sober? Are you vigilant? Do you live for that day when he returns? Or are you living for today that's going to be completely melted and go away forever? And are you sober around eternity? And are you preparing for that day with righteous good acts of the saints? This life is so tempting to not think about where we're going to spend eternity. There's all these people, there's all this stuff, there's work and jobs and children. And... But all of this is just going to go away. I would love to see some, some people approaching their senior years, sober and vigilant and concerned about younger people. As you grow closer to that day, it should be becoming more real for you. And in that reality of, of where you're going, you should be looking back towards the young and be disturbed with anything less than them being prepared for that day. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. It's not a problem that they were sleeping. It took days for them to get ready. So yes, they're not staying up for like eight days, seven days. It was oftentimes a week, okay? So yes, they would, they would sleep and the shofar would wake them up, okay? That's not the issue. But at midnight, there was a shout, behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. So you can't share your oil. And, and what I mean by that is they were prudent. They brought their oil, and that oil is to burn through the night as they're walking back to the Father's house because they're going to the marriage banquet, okay, the wedding banquet. And they need their oil to light the path because those ten virgins are in charge to make sure that nobody stumbles on the way back to the Father's house. To share the oil would mean that halfway there, there wouldn't be any more light for anybody. So you can't share oil, okay? Just like you can't share your life with anybody. It's your life. That oil, and I, I've prayed about this, and this is what I believe I'm hearing from the Lord. That oil is your life, and it's to be used to light the way back to the Father's house, pure and simple. I've heard Pentecostals say, well, it's the Holy Spirit. I've heard, you know, um, Baptists say it is salvation. I, I am telling you it's your life, and it's an oil being offered up to God to light the path back to the Father's house. But the prudent answered, saying, no, there will not be enough for us, and you too, go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourself. 
And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. And he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So let me just tell you this. Did, did, did the bridegroom know them? Yes, he knew them. Okay? What was he saying to them? The, the disrespect that you actually bring upon the father's house by not being prepared for this wedding day shows you the position of your heart towards me. And I don't know you because who does that? Who says that they're involved in a wedding party and doesn't bring oil and be prepared? Who would ever do that? So I'm afraid that I don't know you. And that, like just reading that as a kid, let me just read that one line again. Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. That's not the only parable that talks like that. There's tons of parables that talk like that. Be prepared, be prepared, be prepared, be sober-minded. There's, there's so much that, I, that, I, that my, my heart is grieved by, and it's, it's, it's nothing personal. It's just like, I've seen so many people not be prepared. The hardest thing you've got to, to be as a pastor is to watch people make decisions. You, you get a taste of it like as a father and like, or a mother. Like you watch people make poor decisions when they didn't have to. They knew better. They, they just were foolish. And, and you watch people make poor decisions. And it's like this is like the one decision in your life that you don't want to make poorly. It's forever. We're all headed there to that day. Let me just say this. When we get there, I already know about a few of the gifts. There's this gift that's there, and it's called the joy of the Lord, and we're going to enter into the joy of the Lord. Is anybody excited for that? If anyone in here has ever experienced the joy of the Lord, it's, it's insane, right? It's, it's, it's amazing, and I, think, I don't think we understand like, what our worship's going to be. To worship in the presence of God, I don't even know how we're going to move our lips, Right? There's, there's, there's one of the, there's this gift. I can't wait to, I can't wait to see this. It's Revelations 19. I just want to go there. This glossary is humongous. Do you guys remember the Esther story? Esther was a, um, one of the king's concubines, and there's a guy there named Mordecai who was being honored, and this guy who was close to the king's council, his name was Haman, and he didn't like that Mordecai was being honored over him, so then he plotted to kill the Jews because Mordecai was Jewish. So in the plotting of that, he ended up um, also attacking Esther because Esther was Jewish, so she went in and risked her life to intercede before the king and say, uh, expose Haman, she does. And the very, very, uh, the gallows that was built for Mordecai, Haman hung on. Oftentimes a king for his queen will destroy the enemies of the queen in honor of the queen and as a gift. So saying this, like, now that you're with me, you have no enemies because I'm going to take care of them for you. Is that cool? I'm going to read Revelation 19 for you. Verse 17, it says this, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the kings, generals, and mighty men of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf, 
With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider of the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. That's pretty savage, right? He sounds like um, a, a savage barbarian uh, army king right there, handling your enemies. Let me just tell you this. I have one adversary. Do you know who it is? Peter actually says he's your adversary. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for the weak and the sick to destroy. I've had the devil and his interference in my life as you have had my entire life. Any Anytime sickness or death has come upon us, anytime we had a miscarriage, um, everything my dad has walked through, he's, he's, he's coming after my kids. He wants my kids to be thrown into a lake of fire with him. He's going to be thrown into a lake of fire in front of my eyes. My enemy will be dealt with, and I won't have problems after that. No more temptations, no more tempter. What a wedding gift. I was telling somebody the other day, I think I was telling Corey, I'm going to get popcorn, a big old bowl of it. I'm going to sit there and enjoy it. I'm serious. That, that spiritual being that's caused all this ruckus, all this destruction, is going to be dealt with. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will repay. It's going to be a cool gift to receive on that day when he deals with my enemy completely. And I never have to worry about him again. And I understand revelations in the thousand years and all that. One day he will be dealt with, done, done. There's also... Um, I'm going to also have all of my righteous acts that I did for him laid out in front of both of us. And he's going to say, job well done, if I'm saved on that day, if I endure till the end. Could you imagine that? God spilling out everything that you've done for him in front of you and him, and him just saying, thank you so much. Your life has really meant a lot to me. And I was able to, to do what I purposed in you because you were willing and you kept this day in mind. And enter the joy of the Lord. Here, come watch this guy burn in this lake. And then we're going to go go eat together. I want to show you your house where I've prepared for you of all eternity. And all your people are there. Everyone who's for me is there. And we're all going to live together for eternity. You don't have to worry about anything ever again. Ugh. Isn't that good? See, if you don't think about that, if you don't dwell on that, you're going to be dwelling on this. And this ain't going to make it. So going back to the parable. There's, you either bring his name honor or you bring it shame with your life. He's given you gifts. He's given you the Holy Spirit. And in the way that Jesus talks about it, he's given as much Holy Spirit as you want. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? He's also given you gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's also given you the fivefold ministry to prepare the work of the saints that you might be prepared on that day, that you might be dressed in fine linen of the righteous acts of the saints. He's, he has set you up well. Do not neglect how well you've been set up. And don't neglect what he's given for something else that doesn't compare to it. Last week, we talked about Esau who gave up his inheritance for a cup of soup. I'm going to give him a little bit more credit. It was a bowl of soup, not just a cup. But like, there's a sobriety that comes. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just talk to you straight again, like I did last week and the week prior. I've, I've been praying for this house to be cleansed of sin. I've been praying that. And I, I said, one of the disciplines of the Lord is when a pastor will come up and just address it directly, right? We've all been addressed directly. You've been addressed directly by me because I feel like the Lord told me to address it directly. The next thing that happens is then you get exposed in your sin by his grace. He'll humiliate you to keep you from destruction. Is that good? It's wonderful news because he doesn't want you on that day to end up in the place where he doesn't desire you. 
So he'll expose your sin so that you might, might have time to repent for it. So that's what I've been praying. I said, Father, we're cleaning out this house. I, I, you told us to be a holy people. I want a holy people. Expose sins. Let's get it out. Now, does he, does he need to expose you? Absolutely not. You can repent for your sin. You can confess your sin. And he'll forgive you of, of all your unrighteousness, right? And that's good news. But if we don't because of pride, he'll often expose us. And then from there, we get to make a choice. I'm, I'm praying. I'm praying that because I want this to be a place where God's honored. I want this to be a place, a house, where his name is honored, where he's actually made famous for what it is that he's done. Not where he's, not where he's dishonored or people think Christ is a joke based on the bride because the bride doesn't look ready. Because the world is looking at the bride. And if the bride doesn't have her veil on, and if the bride's not ready, they say this, that groom's never coming. That groom doesn't even exist. Either we come up here. After this um, service, I, I want to I talk to anybody who's um, 60 years or older. If you're in this church, I'm going to end a little bit early so I have time to talk to you. If you're 60 years or older and you attend this church, I just want to kind of gather with you guys um, just briefly after the service. I'll make sure that you guys um, have time. So bear that in mind. We're just going to kind of gather here at the front. I just want to talk to you, because I, I don't know, next week Brian's talking, and I don't know what he's talking on, and I don't know what I'm talking on the week after that. And I, I, I feel a sobriety and a ser seriousness around, around this window specifically, that these last three weeks have just been a, a opportunity for people to really get straight and figure out what it is they want to live for and how they want to do it. So I'm going to pray here in a second. And I, I, I let the Holy Spirit know that if, if you don't if you don't do something in people's hearts, like if you don't convict them, then I just, it's silliness for me to be up here talking to them. So I'm, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God. I don't need people to come to the front because it's an altar call. Like I said before, the goal is not repentance. The goal is holiness. Repentance is a tool to get back onto holy living. Does that make sense? So I, 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 could, I could, we have music playing and, and I'm talking and you could be like, I'm going to the front. If you're straight, don't come to the front. But if God convicts you of something, then you come to the front. And we've been doing this now. This is the third week we've done this. And, and um, I'm going to pray and ask God that the sobriety and the awareness of that day and of sin and what it does would come upon you. And if it comes upon you, Come to the front. So, Father, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you warned us of the cliff and, and you talked to us about the cliff and you told us stories about the cliff and you said, don't, don't fall off this cliff. Don't, don't, get, don't get near it. Don't play around with it. And we see that time and time again in these parables and, and then you send loving people to come and warn people again, not just in your word, but through sermons about it. I thank you for all the gifts that you've given us to live a holy life. I thank you for the greatest gift of all that you've made your home within us. You've called this, this body your temple where you dwell. At the core of my being is you. The Bible says, how, how, how could we sin any longer? May it never be. there's anybody in here who has willful sin in your life you've seen the line you know it's wrong and you don't if you've if you've given up on it and you've just decided i want jesus and this you can't have jesus and this you just get to have in this jesus doesn't double date he doesn't say hey cool bring that along it's not cool and you don't bring it along you drop it you let it go you run from it
this is what he promises in his word. He says, if you humble yourself, he will give you grace. That's the empowerment to live above it. He says that if you confess your sins, that he is faithful and will forgive you. And not only that, but he will wipe you clean of all unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that Satan doesn't get to tempt you anymore. But that's all it is, is temptation. I'm just going to ask you guys to do something briefly. If you came up to the altar during these last two weeks, could you just go ahead and raise your hand right now? If God did something, if, if, if you've been able to overcome something because you came up to this altar and you got it off your chest, will you raise your hand? Amen. Good job. So, Father, I thank you. Now, conviction, will you come? Holy Spirit, will you bring conviction into this place? If there's anybody in here that's messing around with something that they shouldn't be messing around with, because they thought it was cool, because they just thought they'd be forgiven and everything's fine. Will you kick that lie out right now? Everything is not fine. Will you remove it from them right now and let conviction come in? Will you waken alive the conscience that's in, in the hearts of people? Will you waken that up again right now, God? tell you this. This is rare in today's church culture. It's rare. It's rare among relationships. So the opportunity is rare. This opportunity is rare. What I'm saying right now is rare. And so it's a window of opportunity to crawl through and to crawl out. And it's going to shut soon. anybody out there who, who doesn't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if, you've, if you're not living for him, I, I don't care about a, a sentence you said when you were little, but if you're not living for him and you want to know him in a greater way and you want to start that journey, we just go ahead and raise your hand. service, we'll talk about getting you baptized, what it means to live for Jesus Christ. This opportunity is closing in five seconds. Amen. Are you guys ready? Father, I thank you for every person that's up here right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for their heart. I thank you for their ability to sense you and to feel you and that they would come up here. And I thank you for their humility. I thank you for the grace that's being poured out and your presence that's up here right now. Thank you for pouring out your power on them, that they, at the heart of who they are, have you inside of them, that they are pure and that they are holy and that the veil would be lifted off of them and that they could see that they could live godly lives because you dwell in them. And I thank you for who you are, God, and I thank you that you care for them. And Holy Spirit, you're a great teacher, and I thank you that you're going to come alongside of them in a greater way. They're going to hear your voice in a greater way. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are so good. Amen. I'm going to have the guys come over here. I'm going to have the girls go over there. If you could. This is probably the most important part of this thing. I want you to find somebody's hand. I want you to shake it. And this is what I want you to do. Can I have somebody come up here, Tabitha? Could you come up here? Oh, wait. No, there's... You guys are... Hold one person's hand and turn towards them. Hold one person's hand, turn towards them. And this is what I want you to say. When you, they're going to confess to you 
You don't have to go into all the grimy details of it. They're just going to simply confess to you what it is that they have done. And you're simply going to say, Jesus forgives you. Because the Bible says that the believer has the authority to forgive sin. Isn't that amazing? So go ahead right now. Tell them why you're up here. Not all the details, just briefly. Then the other person say, Jesus forgives you. I forgive you in Jesus' name. Likewise, have the other person share. Will you guys thank these individuals for the courage of just coming up here? bless you in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for this congregation. Thank you for purity. Thank you for holiness. Thank you for the life that you prepared for us. Thank you for that house. Thank you that we're all going to get to live together, God. Thank you for destroying our enemies forever. Thank you for the joy of the Lord. Thank you for the gifts that, that are to come. Thank you for the gifts that we have. You're an amazing, amazing, amazing God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen.